In the United States, there are regulations that are put into place by the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, that help keep people alive. Regulations about what can be eaten, what can be sold, where it's packaged, and things of that nature. See, the FDA tries to keep bacteria and other things out of food that we eat, and it's very, very useful. In fact, probably thousands or maybe even millions of people stay alive every year because of these regulations. But did you know that the Bible has something similar to that? You see, the first five books of the Old Testament were written in about 1450 B.C. So a person might not think that they would go back there for modern-day food regulations. But that's showing us something about the Bible. There is scientific foreknowledge in the Bible. It's kind of a, a big word, but it just simply means that the Bible has scientific information in it that there's no way the writers themselves could have derived or come up with on their own. It's looking forward, the foreknowledge, to a time when we do figure it out, but the writers themselves could not have known how valuable it was. One example of this scientific foreknowledge is found in Leviticus chapter 11. Moses was given instructions by God to bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. And there were going to be about two million of them, and they were going to be walking around in the wilderness for 40 years. And so when we look at these regulations, we see that they were designed to keep two million Israelites alive in a camping-type situation for some 40 years. And when we look at the food regulations, we realize that if those regulations had been put into place in the 1700s, 1600s, even the 1800s, they would have kept millions of people alive. But let's look at some of this scientific foreknowledge, some of these food regulations. Leviticus chapter 11, verse 3 says, Among the animals, whatever divides the hoof, having cloven hooves, and chews the cud, that you may eat. Well, and then it goes on and gives you an example of what kind of animal would not fall into that category. And the swine, though it divides the hoof, having cloven hooves, yet does not chew the cud, it is unclean to you. Their flesh you shall not touch, they are unclean to you. So there we go. We have an example of one that has cloven hooves but doesn't chew its cud. Now, what would an animal be that has cloven hooves and does chew its cud? A cow would be an example of an animal that has cloven hooves and chews its cud. And a cow is an herbivore. It takes in plants and turns those plants basically into food that then humans consume. And that is an herbivore that chews the cud and has cloven hooves. But then you look at the swine and you realize that it is an omnivore. It will eat anything. It's a scavenger. It will take in whatever it finds. If it finds the carcass of a dead animal, it will eat it. If it finds a partially alive, diseased animal, it will eat it. You see, a pig has an extremely high probability of ingesting parasites and other disease-causing agents that, if not cooked properly, those diseases would be passed on to whatever consumed the pork, the pig meat. Well, we know that you need to cook pork properly now. In fact, we know it to such a degree that if you were to go into, let's say, your, oh, your local steak place, and you sat down, you ordered a ribeye, and the waitress said, how would you like it cooked? And you said, I'd like it cooked rare. She wouldn't have a problem with that. She'd write down rare on her ticket there, and she'd turn it in. But then if you said, I'd like this pork chop and I'd like it cooked rare, your waitress or waiter would then say, no, I'm sorry we can't cook it rare because the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, has told us that we can't sell a rare pork chop. Well, why not? Why can't you sell a rare pork chop? Well, because we even know in the United States and all around the world that pork has such a higher probability of carrying disease-causing agents. Well, how would Moses have known that in 1450 B.C.? You see, one of the remarkable things about Israelite camps, the way that you can tell in many archaeological finds that this camp is a camp of Israelites is that when they look through the garbage, they don't find Israelites 
pig bones. Now, when they look through the garbage of the Babylonians, they do. When they look through the garbage of the Assyrians, they do. But not the Israelites. You know, if, if there were two million people wandering around in the wilderness and they were going to try to keep from getting food-borne illnesses, one great way would just be to regulate what foods you could eat and what foods you couldn't eat because many times they probably wouldn't have gotten cooked to a degree or to a temperature that would have killed those germ-causing agents. Well, then as you go down the list there in Leviticus chapter 11, you get in verse 9. And it says, These you may eat of all that are in the water, whatever is in the water that has fins and scales, whether in the seas or in the rivers, that you may eat. Now, what animals in the rivers don't have fins and scales? In the seas and the rivers. Well, you're looking at some of those scavenger type fish. A catfish, for instance. Although it would have fins, it does not have scales. And catfish, we know, scavenge the bottom of whatever body of water they are in, and they will eat virtually anything very much like a pig. And then as you start looking at some of those other species that would not have scales and fins, you would come across things like an oyster. Well, you think in modern times we understand about oysters, about cooking them properly. We do. But you know there are regulations about oysters and where you can eat them raw, when you can eat them raw, and when it's a good idea to eat them raw. In fact, if you're a big oyster fan, you probably know the rule that you should not eat a raw oyster in any month that doesn't have an R in it. May, June, July, August. Now, why is that? Well, because if you are transporting oysters, and it's a hot month here in the United States of America, if those oysters warm up to a certain temperature, then the bacteria that grow in oysters will start to grow. And that bacteria, guess what? You can't see it, you can't smell it, and it's tasteless. In fact, there is a certain bacteria that grows in oysters that has a death rate of 50%. That means that one out of every two people that eat an oyster with this certain bacteria die. As we look at that regulation for all animals in the rivers and the seas that can be eaten need to have scales and fins, that is a remarkably accurate way to keep people from getting foodborne illnesses from things like oysters or catfish or other animals that take in germ, disease-ridden things, and those things would be passed to the consumer. Well, as you go further in the list, you get down to about verse 19, verse 20, and it says, These also shall be unclean to you among the creeping things that creep on the land. The large lizard after its kind, the gecko, the monitor lizard, the sand reptile, the sand lizard, the chameleon, these are unclean to you. That's verse 29. As you look there in verse 29, you see that all the lizards are unclean. Now, why lizards? You see, in verse 20, it started telling you about the birds, and then it gets down to 29 tells you about the lizards. Well, it just so happens, if you were to look at the amphibian and lizard veterinarian regulations or their suggestions, here's what they say. Amphibians and reptiles have such a high probability of carrying the bacteria salmonella you need to assume that they have salmonella and you need to wash your hands every time that you touch one of them. And the interesting thing about the bacteria salmonella is that you don't have to touch the actual reptile. You would just have to touch something that the reptile had touched to get salmonella. And what just so happens there in verse 29 and following in the book of Leviticus, it talks about how even if one of these reptiles touches a plate or a bowl, you have to wash it or some of those earthenware bowls, you would have to destroy them. So what are we seeing? Somehow Moses in 1450 B.C. had regulations that rival or sometimes are even better than the ones that the FDA has come up with in the modern scientific era? How is that? Well, that would be coming straight from God. 